Hey, welcome back to another episode of Masses United. I'm very excited to be joined by Sean today. Uh, he has done so much work, I'm not even going to try to reference all of it, but if you've seen a video about the Canadian left, he probably was a mastermind involved with the editing of it. And when I say left, I mean the true left, not the liberal left or the various uh, arms that you see coming out lately uh, to support the Liberal Party and whatnot. So Sean, welcome so much. Thank you for making the time to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to talk about the uh, ending of the planet via climate change. It's really good. Yeah. It's my most like favorite topic. <laughs> Is so much of your work revolves around climate and what we can do to leave a better um, uh, ecological footprint, just a survivable footprint for our, <laughs> our children. Um, and one of the things I want to talk to you about today was the IPC, uh, because you are so genius when it comes to your editing and your production. And for me, I cannot understand this report. I've gone through it a few times. I'm like, holy shit, this is so depressing. And I just kind of pass out uh, from the terror. Um, can you make this understandable to fools like me? Like, what is this report about? And why do they say it's a red alert, but nobody seems to care about it? I haven't seen any media stories about it since. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I, so I'll start with that last point there. I think that's like uh, probably the most depressing part of, of the entire report is that we had, you know, maybe 72 hours of, of media talking about this. They're literally calling it a red alert in their headlines to get you to click. Uh, and then they, they, don't talk about it at all uh, anymore. Um, but what is really actually in, in this report is not a whole lot of new information. This one in particular is specifically about sort of like where is the climate science at? There are two other sections of the report which are supposed to come out uh, I think next February and, and March, which are um, what is, you know, what are the implications of these on uh, a variety of different very specific ecosystems um, and, and sort of like regions as a whole. And then the third one is basically like, what can we do about it? So I'm really looking forward to that last one. Let's hope there's like at least one little nugget of, of hope that we can like take away from that because the, the nuggets of hope are very uh, scant in this one. Um, but it does, it basically what this one does is like has even more data than, than the previous uh, addition from a few years back um, that really solidifies the data. Like at this point, it is it is no there is no you know debate at all about whether or not um, uh, global warming is happening and that it is uh, caused by by human activity. They've now you know there's um, there's a great article um, that uh, uh, Brian Tokar, who's I think the the uh, director right now of the Institute of Social Ecology has written uh, about sort of breaking this down. Uh, and there's a, a couple of really interesting pieces in there where he's talking about the, you know, the amount of data that they've pulled from, from ice cores uh, in, in the high Arctic now that, that prove, you know, not only that uh, warming has increased over just the last thousands of uh, thousand years, but, but the last many thousand years, like we are in completely unprecedented times. So that, that much is, is clear. There, there is no de debate um, that the consensus is that we, we are facing uh, human um, caused and let's be very specific here, um, uh, corporation and capitalist caused um, climate change. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's, it is dire, right? That's where it's why it's so frustrating that the media isn't um, talking about this as much as they ought to be there. They don't have um, experts uh, really on past those, those few headline dates. And that's something I think we should be seeing now is people educating um, the general public on, you know, very basic, you know, the kind of stuff that honestly, like, grade school kids are, are learning now we're not even getting on on you know even like the cbc you know i can understand that the corporate media uh maybe has less of an interest in this but like the cbc it should be their their mandate as the public broadcaster to be explaining why you know we have to um reach the peak of emissions before 2050 or we're looking at 2.5 to 4 degrees of warming. And, and you know, that's a statistic that's that's pulled out of this report with 90% confidence. You know, that's that's the kind of um, that's the kind of information that I don't think most people are are hearing and what really the implications of that are, right? Um, there's, a, there's a whole section in there dedicated to sea level rise and how we're looking at um, you know, sort of nearly two, two feet if emissions continue to rise at 
at current paces, even if we sort of meet uh, or exceed the Paris um, targets, we're looking at still a foot of sea level rise. And that varies obviously depending on where you are uh, in the world. But, you know, if we, um, if, you know, sort of like the, the best estimates that we have um, are true, you know, we're, we're looking at potential sea level rises um, of six to 15 feet. And, and this is the, a quote here, it says that can't be ruled out due to deep uncertainty in how um, the ice uh, sheets in uh, Greenland, uh, the Arctic and, and the Antarctic um, deal with uh, the, the rising emissions. Um, so there's a lot of- If really, I could jump oh, in, ahead. like yeah. we say two feet, like what is the impact to the average person? Because for, for a lot of people, they may not be be caring about two feet. Like, okay, sweet, the beach is gonna be close to my house. Like, mm -hmm. what does that like what are the impact of this report? Like in, in childish terms, because I am very simple, like why does this matter? Does it just mean that there's gonna be less bumblebees in the air and I can have a quicker <laughs> drive to the beach? Like, what does it really mean to me as a as a person? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so again, de depending on where you are, the implications are are um, dramatically different, right? In in many of the Pacific Island nations, uh, nations in in you know the Indian Ocean, things like that, um, the Caribbean, uh, we're we're looking at you know entire islands disappearing, right? Uh, we're look we're talking about um, if if you know we do if we if we approach some of these higher levels of sea level rise situations. Um, much of Florida uh, going away. Um, I'm still not hearing you, a bad point. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but but you know at the same at the same time you know we're, we're talking like many coastal regions um, uh, are are definitely facing serious consequences, and, and we're seeing right now in in New York what even at this stage um, the the impacts of um, more, um, you know, more activity from the oceans is actively doing to, to places that simply don't have the infrastructure. Um, you know, concrete has never been designed to, to withstand this level of, um, this level of, of precipitation even like when we're talking about simple uh, I mean it's, it's a hurricane let's be let's be honest about what it is but right like we're, we're talking about just like rainfall can't be handled when we when we think about um, places like uh, Bangladesh uh, we're, we're looking at um, places where you know the that entire delta um, that entire river delta is going to flood uh, millions of people being displaced right there is so much of the world that either between the ocean level rise or the increase in in temperatures uh, we're talking about millions if not you know billions of people who are going to become climate refugees uh, within this within this century right within our lifetime um, and and increasing right um, that's that's the other really um, scary part about this report is is the warning about uh, increasing uh, extreme weather events mm -hmm. um, and and not only their their increasing frequency and severity, uh, but them compounding. <laughs> uh, and so this is you know we saw an example of this in Canada this year with the town of Lytton, BC, where you had one um, extreme weather event, which was the heat dome, creating you know the the most uh, the, the highest temperature recorded in the entirety of North America. I think I, I read. It was potentially the entirety of North America and Europe, um, and and then that turned into you know um, these extreme wildfires, and so you have these two compounding events which ultimately burned down in an entire town, and that's the kind of thing that's going to become um, more and more common, um, and uh, yeah, it, I, I'm, you know these compound events um, are are a serious threat that I think even that is only starting to begin to be understood. And that's such a terrifying prospect. And like, from my understanding as well, like the Syrian civil war began because of uh, climate change as well. We had um, mm -hmm. people who were being pushed from the rural into urban centers, which was heightening so many different problems and tensions that already existed. So while we see this loss of life and this extraordinary um, pain and trauma that people are subjected to, they are going to move their 
lives to new circumstances. And with mm -hmm. that, it brings about a whole a myriad of political outcomes that we can't even begin to comprehend in the moment. Um, mm -hmm. Never mind trying to bring in refugees and support however we can. Um, at that same time, though, uh, CBC just recently had uh, an economist come out and tell us that the Liberals' plan was A+, plus, uh, top of the line. So how can we be saying that things are bad and need to be improved upon if we're already doing so great? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's a really sound economic policy to, um, you know, to fund all of our climate initiatives through, through the, you know, profits of a pipeline. I think that's like, you simply can't get better, you can't get better climate um, policy than that. All of that profit, uh, you know, you really can't, you really can't um, play down the, the value of all that you know, that yeah. beautiful surplus value from our, our lovely bitch pin um, being offloaded into, let's let's be very clear, right? Offloaded into other countries so that it can be part of their carbon budget to to deal with, right? You know, ooh, that, that sweet, sweet cash coming to Alberta and Saskatchewan just so countries in in East Asia um, can can burn that fuel um, and and then we can, you know, make sure we have those uh, lovely conservatives who are, who are saying, well, it's, you know, it's all China now. They're the ones who are burning all of the fuel. And it's like, well, but who, who sold it to them, right? Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, this, this is where the actions we take now are ex like so important, right? It, it's been 40 years we've known about these issues and, and nothing to the scale of what we need to see is being done. And you have... Um, people like an, an economist fueled by, you know, right wing think tanks um, are, are coming out and praising the liberal platform. Frankly, none of the major parties right now are having, um, you know, the actions we really need to be taking in, in their platform. And, um, and that's, you know, that's a, that's a major concern. You have part of the liberal platform from 2019, which they've done, I don't, I've, I've heard of, of a single, um, one of the two billion trees planted yeah. uh, in the two years they've, they've, um, they've been in power. And, uh, you know, obviously COVID uh, makes it completely impossible to have people outdoors um, planting trees. That's just obviously you can't, you can't socially distance when you're outside yeah. planting, uh, you know, trees in appropriate distance from each other. But it's not just that, right? What's, what's really frustrating is, is when you have a plan like that, where it is, we're going to plant two billion trees. It um, it was never fully outlined um, by the liberals uh, how those trees would be appropriate. Um, you know, i.e., are the native um, trees and are, and are um, replanted in such a way that they're fostering, say, like the mycelial networks that mm -hmm. that are necessary in order for all of those trees to increase the amount of carbon that gets sequestered into what then becomes a, a healthy and, uh, and robust ecosystem, right? The more biodiversity that we can get in, um, in ecosystems, the more resilient that ecosystem be, is because you then have you know, different organisms that can sort of be a fail safe, a backstop if, uh, if this or that, um, uh, you know, animal, plant, what have you, um, ends up going extinct or, or is severely, um, is severely, uh, you know, hindered by, by um, the effects of, of climate change. And, um, you know, sort of bouncing off of this, I, this idea uh, a little bit, um, this is another point that's made in the IPCC report uh, about uh, how we have to take these kinds of urgent actions now, right? The sort of, um, and I'm speaking specifically of uh, rewilding areas um, specifically to their native um, ecosystems and um, how over time the, the cumulative um, impact of, um, of carbon emissions is going to uh, only increase over time how the the proportion of that which stays in the atmosphere and the ability for um, for organisms on land and in, in oceans to sequester that carbon becomes less and less over time. That the, the proportion that it's able to to do it, it's able to increase, but. 
But at a certain point, you know, uh, already I think we're seeing the Amazon is becoming a net carbon um, emitter due to uh, due to deforestation. Um, uh, then, then it should be uh, a carbon sink. Um, and we're talking about where, you know, currently um, the, the amount that, that rests in um, the atmosphere uh, is, is around 30 to 35 percent. And we're looking at that doubling to 62 wow. percent if emissions um, begin to rise uh, more rapidly or 56 percent if uh, emissions increase at, at the current pace, which it kind of looks like they are going to continue. And so this is where, again, it's so important to take these actions now to be uh, aspiring for that sort of ecological worldview, how can we can be in um, reciprocity with, um, with the natural, the rest of the natural world uh, now is, is, is going to set us up obviously for a better situation today, but, but going forward for centuries, right? Um, and if we don't take that action now, the positive impacts of, um, of rewilding and, and other things like that get dramatically diminished um, and set us up for, you know, a situation where, where the Earth may look a lot more like Venus than, uh, than it does today. Uh, and and uh, yeah. It, it bothers me that, that I'm not even sure at what level of hyperbole that is, uh, or yeah. even if it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's interesting, like, if, if I can, then just jumping to the action side, like, mm -hmm. um, it sounds to me like you're saying the Liberals planting 0% of the 2 billion trees is a problem. Um, I think yeah. I may have heard you say that the NDP doubling fossil fuel subsidies also is not an action that we need to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. It sounds as though you may be suggesting capitalism itself uh, is the issue that we need to resolve. Um, and one of the things for me, at least, is I've joined the Communist Party. I'm getting more involved with tent unions and, and uh, labor unions and trying to building up some type of citizens resistance to all of this. But I think you might have a better perspective of the ecology of tactics we need to truly revolutionize the system that we're using to destroy us. Um, I don't know if you might be willing to share some thoughts on these direct actions that we need to take uh, to try to make the world uh, survivable, or at least not Venus. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trying to avoid a Venus scenario um, at all costs, for sure. Um, but yeah, to, to answer your question, I think, um, you know, I won't disparage anyone who, who's thinking of joining um, the, the NDP, the Communist Party, uh, whatever you, wherever you are right now, I, I understand that I've probably been there too. Um, and I think that ecology of tactics is useful, right? I think having uh, an entity like the Communist Party who, who has, you know, an established reputation and is able to outflank um, the NDP, call out their flaws, um, and and do some of that popular education is important right now. Where you know we're at a stage where the the left is only starting to get you know its footing um, to to a degree that it doesn't even have the overwhelming sway within um, the you know the, the so-called labor party of the NDP, um, let alone the, the broad the broader society. Um, and I think for from my perspective, you know where these things are. Um, helpful. Some for me, some of the flaw comes in um, their their sort of like reluctance to let go of um, you know systems of hierarchy um, and a belief in the power of state. Um, specifically, when we're talking about you know a colonial state like Canada, and you know there's there's not a non negligible part of me that believes um, that you know, simply participating in parties that are vying for, um, you know, vying in the, for a position in the horse race of a Westminsterial mm -hmm. colonial government is um, inherently problematic and is, is you know, doing a disservice um, to leftist movements by not, you know, uh, operating in a way that is prefiguring the world we, we want to build. Um, I think, uh, you know, when we think about how you build support for, um, you know, the NDP, the Communist Party, what have you, your tenant union, um, in each one of those cases, you know, we're going to have people in two weeks who, who um, have done all this canvassing for their, their um, 
the candidate that they want to support and they want to win. Um, and, and you know, I think it's great. Go get go get involved um, with with whatever organization you you think um, aligns with you right now. But you know, what do you do the day after the the election, right? Every single one of those people who are out there canvassing, they are um, actioning um, their connection to the community, right? What, whether you're trying to build support for, for an NDP candidate, um, a communist candidate, uh, for your tenant union, um, for your mutual aid group, all of these things, the common denominator is your connection to your neighbors, to your community. And I think it's in building up that, that people power through your community that we can um, basically, you know, supplant um, what is currently, you know, hierarchical systems of, of state power, right? When you, um, you know, when I organize uh, in mutual aid groups and uh, in other, you know, activities that I'm doing locally, um, if I were to then, you know, take uh, all this community power that I, uh, that is being built by connecting with my neighbors, with with the rest of my local ecosystem, um, and then you know take that away and centralize it in a party apparatus. Um, you're you you've basically you know kneecapped all of that organizing. You've done you've taken you've gone from an area where you, where people have that direct um, democratic action and that direct you know impact on. Um, on what the group is doing, how it's connecting with the community, how you're helping your community, and then you're centralizing all of that power um, in, in a way that that removes you by steps of magnitude away from um, from that direct decision making ability um, from those debates, um, all of these um, all of these actual tools and levers that you have to to take that action. And um, what I think is uh, particularly um, harmful about that in the context of the climate crisis is that this is an anti-ecological worldview, right? Mm. Um, there, there is no systems of institutionalized hierarchy in, in nature. This is not how it operates. It operates in uh, reciprocal nature with itself. And, I think that's where we have an ability to, rather than, you know, take that community power and transfer it into some centralized hierarchical system to um, connect and, and link between different um, organizations, mutual aid groups with ten uh, organizations, um, prisoners' rights groups with Black Lives Matter, um, affinity groups, all of these things, and build a you know confederation of um, you know a, a commune of communes. Really, mm. is sort of the the um, snappy way to to put it. Um, but I think this is so integral right now because we have to adopt this ecological worldview, and we have to be looking to um, find those ways that are appropriate for your community to make them resilient. You know, I just mentioned how these instances of compounding emergencies um, are going to become more and more um, common. So, you know, understanding through, you know, I'm, I'm in Toronto, so maybe it's through speaking to um, Toronto Region Conser uh, Conservation to understand, oh, well, actually, you know, where I am is a flood risk because we don't have um, you know, we don't have adequate um, drainage in my community. So can we, as a community, come together and create um, uh, drainage uh, gardens by the curbside? So replacing what would be concrete with um, uh, digging that up and, and making it um, plants where you can both sequester carbon and they're going to handle some of the, you know, increased um, <clears throat> rainflow. Uh, talk if your community is one where um, food sovereignty is really bad, then, um, you know, building, fostering community gardens and, you know, communicating, um, go to the farmer's market, talk to your local farmers, see if they are, um, you know, operating in 
um, the context of a regenerative agricultural system? Mm -hmm. Do they have anyone who's willing to sponsor them, um, whether it's through through the government or through community cooperatives, um, to rewild some of their land for the value that it would be productive if they were to be growing food. Try and, you know, by building food forests in urban communities, we're both sequestering carbon, um, you know, increasing people's access to food and building up those community systems where when you are in an emergency, we're going to need, um, we're going to need uh, the, that community power to be able to feed ourselves, right? If, if the, um, you know, it, how quickly uh, systems of distribution um, have fallen apart as the various hurricanes have hit landfall in, in the States over the last little bit, um, you know, that, that has to have a backstop for people. And right now that, that's not coming from the government. That's not coming from capitalist systems. And so we have to be the ones who build that system. And, you know, from my perspective, it's in building that system and connecting each of those different groups who are focused on their, their individual area of affinity that we can um, actually build up the, the power to, um, to, you know, kind of render current, you know, the current colonial system null and void at the end of the day. And obviously that's, you know, very uh, utopian um, outlook and, and, a, and a very long-term strategy. You know, we're talking about things that probably won't even happen fully in my lifetime, um, but understanding that that is the ultimate outcome and not engaging in um, systems of organization that aren't moving us towards that goal uh, for me is, is sort of the, the strategy and how we should be, um, organizing ourselves. Yeah. That's like really interesting. And like good as always, like for me, one of the things I wonder about is like, um, like I go through like these emergency planning sessions that the government's now asking people to do because our climate is hell and they're worried about people just like the loss of life. And so I've gone through the sheet and actually it's really interesting. It looks very similar to like, if you were to organize with a union or a tenant union or whatnot, it's like go through your community, identify who the leaders are, find out who can deliver uh, mutual aid. So who you can rely on to maybe uh, support with repairing damaged vehicles, damaged items. If there is like a, a weather event, um, whose house can you go to that's on safe ground? Um, where is the local access to food? Where's the local access to water if um, major transport is blown out? Um, mm -hmm. So it's like they provide you this sheet to prepare for the revolution. And it is interesting to me because although I have signed up for the Communist Party, because my personal perspective is with how bad things are, I just need to get running. And I usually run first and think later. So if there's another entity or group that exists that is organizing this stuff, I am a thousand percent down. Um, for me, what I would like to do is have these worksheets and then feed them into, as you say, a commune of communes. And we're all working together to say, okay, so this neighborhood, they're great. They've got like five doctors. Maybe we can have somebody specifically tasked to an adjacent area. But I feel like the government doesn't care about this shit. I feel like a lot of the organizing groups out there, they've, they're so stretched so thin, they don't have those relationships. This might be too broad of a question, but are there any entities out there that are kind of building towards that commune of communes or, or where you do have the most faith or we're so bad right now, we just need to focus on talking to our neighbor. And that's really what we're at is just the starting blocks. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a really good question. I would say um, the two sort of main areas to look at, you know, particularly where we are in, in Canada, I would, um, I would advocate for everyone to, to look into what are the local indigenous um, organizations um, operating in your area, specifically if you have land protector um, organizations, that's that's a great one to to go. You know, learn from directly from indigenous peoples um, and understand their way of of seeing the world, um, because it's it is a lot closer to the sort of organic and ecological society that we need to be approaching. And so I think that's a that's a great one. You know, they're doing a lot of um, the work um, right now and, and have been for, for generations um, of protecting biodiversity, uh, protecting these, you know, these ecosystems that they, they have been for, um, for again, millennia, um, essentially. And, um, and having that understanding of what are the appropriate solutions um, and, and why is the encroaching, um, uh, you know, 
uh, mechanisms of capital um, so bad for things like, you know, the old growth forests in, in BC, um, in the wetlands and Great Lakes um, in uh, around line three and line five uh, right now. These are, these are all parts of, you know, what Naomi Klein famously coined as blockadia. Um, which I think is something we're going to need to see more of um, over the next uh, few decades, right? The protesting outside of, um, you know, uh, government buildings is not nearly as effective as directly opposing um, a, a piece of infrastructure that we know is at this point going against the best recommendations of science. Um, and then the other you know, organization, unfortunately, I can't give you a, a Canadian reference. Um, I know I have a 100% CanCon mandate, uh, but we're going to have to break that um, here very, very briefly um, to say to look to groups like um, the Black Socialists of America. Um, they are a group that last year um, officially um, changed their stance to one uh, of being rooted in social ecology. They have this excellent um, map on their website called the dual power map uh, and it outlines uh, areas all across the US um, where you can um, get involved with um, community land trusts, mutual aid groups, uh, on and on and on, a, a bunch of different um, worker cooperatives. It, yeah, you, you get the picture. Um, and then I would also, you know, advise people to look to um, to Cooperation Jackson Jackson as a um, you know one example of a community who has um, been able to take root in you know what we would typically consider to be you know a Republican um, dominant state and um, and are building up that community power have built up systems of uh, mutual aid and systems that are starting to exit the world of capital. And one other group I would definitely mention, I know they're, they're still relatively new, but it's, it's one supported by the Institute of Social Ecology and it's called Symbiosis. Um, and they are uh, trying to form that confederation of community organizations across North America um, and, uh, and fostering, you know, an ideal um, of direct democracy and an ethic rooted in, um, in uh, ecology. Uh, and so I think that's another one to, to look at, um, you know, there hopefully we'll see chapters um, um, related to, to symbiosis and some of these other groups um, start to pop up in, uh, in and across uh, so-called Canada over the next, you know, few years or, or the next decade, um, as, you know, we come together through, you know, all the types of organizations we've listed from tenant organizations to, to uh, Indigenous organizations to, you know, you name it. Um, all of those uh, groups have at least some affinity and connecting them and, and building up that network that then can be, um, you know, utilized uh, in, in a way that's not centralized, uh, but still just as powerful as, you know, a, a more central uh, or national uh, system would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, like when you bring that up, one thing makes me wonder, I know that we're tight for time, so we'll probably end soon here, but I wanted to ask your perspective of, um, I know there was a, a McDonald's in France, which would temporarily close the doors, I think because of air quote labor shortage, uh, but that was taken over by the people, uh, the municipal group that ran, uh, that, the, sorry, the municipal group uh, in France that was connected to that action uh, was fairly socialist themselves, and they just liberated that whole center, and it's now officially, I think, a, a community food uh, distribution uh, hub. And I, I do wonder, is there a role for municipalism in this? Like, uh, as you speak to like these various groups that do such good work, um, is there a, a municipalist element that you've either witnessed or would recommend people look to in terms of getting involved with? Yeah, I think, it, I mean, in Canada, the, the best municipalist group we have right now, I think is Horizon Ottawa. Mm -hmm. um, they're definitely sort of the, the most established and um, are a good model to look at if you're, if you're looking to um, start a group like this here. Uh, but this idea of, you know, liberating um, fast food joints to become community kitchens is, is one that I'm, uh, I'm actually quite uh, attracted to. I think it's, I think it's incredible and we should be doing more of it. You know, the, there's been countless memes and, and, and jokes about uh, pay your, 
pay your workers a living wage and they they won't like you know quit on the spot kind of thing and i think that misses the mark because this is an opportunity to um, again, if we if we were to have that kind of community power, if you have, um, say, a community land trust who then, um, you know, through de direct democratic processes wants to decide what happens in their community, um, you know, they can look to the McDonald's that um, is shutting down or threatening to shut down or can't operate because it doesn't have uh, you know, the labor shortage, there's, there's no, there's low labor confidence, uh, is what I like to say. And, um, and, uh, and this is an opportunity where we can, um, you know, through that group decide this should be now um, public. This is now something that we should add to a library of assets where you, you can go and um, cook with people, learn to cook with people, provide food for your community. You know, it's one thing to have um, these structures of community gardens and that thing that are growing food, which you could then distribute. Uh, maybe you're putting them in community fridges and that kind of thing. But if you were to then, you know, you're, you're starting to um, eke out these, these distribution systems by by expanding this I do now community kitchen. Uh, you know, you, you started with the garden, you got the fridge, you know, you, you've like done the upgrade. It's like, it's, I feel like it's like a Sims or a tycoon game or something like that, but good. And, yeah. um, and, and I think that's um, the kind of thing we haven't really started to see yet. Um, you know, there's been, again, these, these sort of um, um, little like peaks through, you know, like cracks of in, 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 the system of capital, um, where you're seeing people come together and fostering um, some of these, you know, these systems or like the little little pieces that can ultimately kind of uh, come together and and form um, that kind of larger um, community resource network and these larger libraries of of um, uh, of resources distribution systems. Uh, you name it, that kind of thing. It's, it's amazing how it, it does appear at the end of the day, everything is so interconnected. And we talk about all these things and it really all is just talking to your neighbor and really just building mm -hmm. simple relationships. So together we can construct these more elaborate um, constructions to save society. Um, I, I know that your time is precious. I, I did want to ask, like, is there anywhere particularly that you would like to, to end this conversation is what you feel is maybe the most important or you would like people to, to put kind of top of mind as they look themselves to how they can be of best value in rebuilding this world to one that's survivable. Yeah, I think, you know, I would, I would recommend everyone to um, Google Murray Bookchin.jpg and, um, and, you know, start to start to think about your world from an ecological perspective. Is it just like what you're saying? It is about all of the connections we have to each other, but also to the rest of the natural world, right? When we speak of things in terms of natural resources, um, it's in this way that um, erases all of the the work, um, all of the, the sort of labor time that that the natural world has um, has put into um, that tree or that iron mine or, or whatever it is that that we think we can just come and plunder without being reciprocal to to that natural world, and um, yeah, I think you know. Join, uh, go and go and find a local organization. Start small with a mutual aid group, um, with you know within your your community, a tenant organization within your building, um, you know whatever sort of organization, whatever your affinity is, whatever your your point of interest is, um, start there. Uh, if you are canvassing again right now with um, any political party, um, if you if you put the you know the gloves down is that a good uh, analogy after after September twentieth um, you know I would see that as a missed opportunity and you should be continuing to work with those people who you're out there with right now and, and so I guess to summarize this point um, yeah f find a way to get involved find a way to connect with your neighbors find a way to connect then with you know similar people doing. Um, 
doing similar things or complementary things, right? You don't have to be, if, if you are a tenant union and you have friends um, who are organizing with Black Lives Matter, there, there are, there's crossover there, right? And, and we need to be building those, those networks um, and those connections. Um, and I'm going to, uh, this is maybe super duper cliche, but I'm just going to, to read a beautiful quote um, from Marie Bookchin that I think sort of summarizes this and why this should be our, our approach and our outlook. Hmm. Uh, and he says, uh, he, he's speaking here of the, the traditional leftist libertarian, you could call it anarchist, you can call it communalist. Um, but he says, libertarian forms of organization have the enormous responsibility of trying to resemble the society they are seeking to develop. They can tolerate no disjunction between ends and means. Direct action so integral to the management of a future society has its parallel in the use of direct action to change society. Communal forms so integral to the structure of a future society have their parallel in the use of communal forms collectives, affinity groups, and the like to change society. The ecological ethics, confederal relationships, and decentralized structures we would expect to find in a future society are fostered by the values and networks we try to use in achieving an ecological society. And so to me, that's just like this beautiful uh, utopian thought um, of why, you know, we won't simply get to the future society we want to build unless we are the ones who build it. That's so beautifully said. I feel a much less doomer on this gloomy day. Uh, thank you so very much, Sean, for your time and the wisdom you dropped here today. Uh, you're, you're welcome. Thanks, thanks for having me and, and thanks for putting the show together. It's, it's one of my, my new favorites. Oh, so, uh, yeah. We'll pay you later. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, All right, we'll we'll send you, <laughs> sending you and everyone watching. Love and solidarity. Uh, peace. Peace. <laughs> Find a way, boys, for shots are out and better pay, hey, boys. Yes, we're going to win the day, boys. Where the breeze I remember blows.